Hi, I'm David Levin, and welcome to a special episode of Pop Goes the Culture. Today, I have five very special guests from the world of comics, five writers who are among the very best in the industry and who, among other things, have one thing in particular in common. They have all collaborated with an artist named George Perez, a beloved le legend in the industry, not just an artist, actually, but a consummate storyteller who has worked for just about every comic book company and drawn practically every character from each of those companies. Fans and pros alike were shocked and heartbroken to learn in late 2021 that George was diagnosed with stage three pancreatic cancer. And with a prognosis of six to 12 months at the that time, he has chosen not to pursue treatment. Our hearts go out to George and his family. And today I've asked these five friends and collaborators to, collaborators to join me to celebrate George's work, his art and his life. First up, in no particular order, Paul Levitz, former president and publisher of DC Comics, who wrote with George on World's Finest Comics, a team-up book featuring Power Girl and the Huntress. Peter David, who worked with George on Hulk, Future Imperfect, and Sax and Violins. Uh, Kurt Busick, who collaborated on the most amazing Justice League Avengers crossover and a great run in the Avengers after Heroes Return. Mark Wade, who worked on the Brave and Bold reboot, and also on the book, The Art of George Perez. And of course, last and by no means least, uh, writer Marv Wolfman, who co-created the New Teen Titans with George, the groundbreaking Crisis on Infinite Earths. Together, they created characters like Nightwing and Tim Drake and many others. Everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. First, I'm gonna throw this out to everybody. Uh, as we're recording this, how, how is George doing? I spoke to him about two weeks ago. He's in great spirits. I mean, uh, the one thing that George is more than anything is he's the most positive person I've ever known. And you would not know anything is wrong. This is not a disease that causes pain. This is not a disease that creates something other than a slow disintegration of what, what's inside. And he's not letting that take him over. Uh, he is very upbeat, incredibly upbeat. Yeah. And a few weeks before that, we got together at DC mm -hmm. and he was signing books and speaking to all the people who work there. And he was walking around and he was joking and everything else. It's just, it's going to hit. Yeah. But let me add to that, that, you know, when he was in town here in Los Angeles a few weeks ago, there was a party. There was several get-togethers, but there was one specific party. With his, with his friends and, you know, loved ones gathered around. And we were a little nervous before George showed up. I mean, what kind of shape would he be in? What kind of mind frame would he be in? What's his, what, and he showed up and not only is he robust, but he looked great. I mean, he just, he just looked like a thin George. <laughs> um, and it was so delightful to see him so full of life and so vibrant and walking around like not a care in the world and just hugging people and taking photographs and signing people's favorite comics. It was just a, a great afternoon to spend with him. And that is exactly the way that you want, you, you want to be with George. Right, right. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to, to the good stuff and the early stuff. I, I would imagine that, that George's first interaction with one of you guys would probably be, would that be with you, Marv? Yeah, uh, he was just starting out. I was the editor of the black and white Marvel magazines at the time, and he was doing um, White Tiger. Was yeah. that it? Right. So, yeah. Sons of the Tiger. Um, Sons of the Tiger. Sons of the Tiger. Um, and uh, I was his editor on it. What was that early time like with George? Was he uh, was he like he is now? I mean, it's like you've watched him grow probably as much as anybody over time. Was What were the differences between early George and later George? Since George tells the story, uh, I, will have to, uh, I will have to say it the same way. Uh, we met as an editor, and I was not a, a, the easiest editor to always deal with, uh, especially with art. And I, I was an art teacher in junior high school. That was my degree. And that's what I did in the early days. And George brought in some pages he had just begun. Uh, he's really raw at this particular time. 
and I sort of had to sit down and, and felt that I was explaining to him a uh, three, three point perspective, uh, something he had not done correctly. And oh. that's by rules. He, he's self-taught and that talent is self-taught totally. And he talks about that all the time. Um, it wasn't that very, it wasn't very good. And the art was just very beginning and it wasn't very good. And he got angry at this and he walked, he went home and he redrew the pages to prove, prove he was right. And he came back and he threw it on my desk and I went, right. And he went, <laughs> oh, I, that just showed I was wrong. Now I'm doing it correctly. He never stopped them. That's the moment we became friends uh, because it was all about that. Later he asked me why I hired him, why I kept hiring him when his work wasn't ready. And I said, essentially, you, your drawing needs time. You will get there. You will get better in, on your drawing. That's something that as you do more and more of it, you'll do it. But I've never seen anyone who tells a story as well as you. As crude as the drawing was, his storytelling was there from day one. And I said, I can't teach you that. Nobody can teach you that. Uh, the other stuff you can be taught. And you're, you're a natural talent. And that's the reason he, even before his work was good uh, and uh, it was still, he was there. He was just shy of it in the beginning, which is amazing. Uh, within a year, he became the George Perez we already know. We all know. This is a guy who never stopped improving his work. And he's, he's just great, you know? I mean, I know he retired several years ago because uh, of an eye condition. I've never seen an artist who got better and better and better and never in sort of coast a little, at least once or twice, right? There, there are a couple of others, but George is certainly a standard bearer. Joe Kubert got better. You know, every 10 years you look at Kubert's art, you go, he's, he's even better now. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, Bill George, Sienkiewicz also is an artist who has improved over the years. Yes, but but George George tells a story about uh, working on um, Infinity Gauntlet, where he uh, uh, the first issue was out, and a kid came up to him at a convention and told him, y "Your work is so terrific. There's all this detail. You could be the next Todd McFarlane." <laughs> and and, and George was aware that there are a, a lot of artists of his generation who would be insulted by that. You know, I was already here when Todd was starting out, but the way George took it was, this guy didn't know who he was. This, he was encountering George's work for the first time and it hooked him. And that's what George tried to do every single story, every single page, he never forgot that there were people who were gonna see that work for the first time and it better do the job and it better do the job as well as possible. He never wanted to rest on his laurels. Uh, he never wanted to coast. He always wanted to push it and make it better. It was really funny when we were working on Avengers when we gave him an idea for a, uh, uh, a really simple cover, you know, and he'd, he'd argue, he'd say, I feel like I'm cheating <laughs> if I draw something that, that, that only takes me a couple of hours. And we said, George, you'll make it up on the next one. We can't stop you. <laughs> but but he, he always wanted to do more. He always wanted to push it. He's a, he's a terrific storyteller, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mark, let me, let me, let me, yeah, let me go ahead. I'm sorry. No, because I had seen something that you had done where you talked about what he would bring to the table bring like more tables to the table. I mean, it was, it was uncanny. It working with him on, I worked on him several times over the years, but we did our work together on Brave and Bold for 10 issues or whatever it was. And a lot of that was just, okay, George, there's nine characters you haven't drawn yet. Let's figure out who they are and stick a metal, well, the metal men, you know, and let's give George a chance to play in, in, in all those playgrounds. But like specifically, there was an issue with Batman and the Legion of Superheroes. And I thought that would be interesting because we've never seen them together. And, you know, I've got a plot kind of figured out in my head. I haven't written up fully yet, but I got a plot in my head. And 
George, I really got like seven Legionnaires, maybe eight. Paul, you can attest to the fact you don't really want to put 25 Legionnaires in a story if you can help it. <laughs> you know, like six, seven Legionnaires. So just, just remember, George, whoever you put on the cover, I have to put them in the book. So just here's the list of six or seven. We have the cover back and you can see where this is going. Every single Legion, 25 Legionnaires are on the cover. <laughs> so getting all of them into the story was not completely impossible. The dead ones were an issue, <laughs> but I managed to make that work. And the reason I tell, the reason this is not a I'm mad at George story is because he was absolutely right. It was 10 times more fun for him to do it that way. And it showed in the pages. Like you can't fake that. He's just, when he's, and Kirk can speak to this probably better than anybody, when he's excited, especially excited about what he's drawing, it just gets better, it just shines. Yeah. George is what I always refer to as a writer's artist, mm -hmm. which means that he will bring things to the story that you did not even conceive of. And he will build upon and improve whatever it is you have. There, Most of the artists I work with, actually, at this point, all of the artists that I work with, I do what's called full script, which is I break it down on a panel by panel basis. I would never have to do that with George. With George, I would just write what's called the Marvel style, which I would describe the story in broad strokes and know that George's storytelling abilities will give me what I need in order to convey the story properly. I mean, he's just an absolute master at bringing things to it that you could not even imagine. Yeah. In fact, I asked him when we started Brave and Bold, do you want full script? Do you want plot? And he just looked at me like I was crazy. He said, I just want plot. What if, like, he knows he's a good storyteller and his exact quote yeah. was, you know, you're not using me if you're just giving me full script, you know, let me do what I do. And he was, again, he was absolutely right. I mean, part of what is of the essence here is that George is a writer. He just didn't discover he was a writer at the beginning. You know, you took, we, you talked to Marv talked about the three point perspective issue and said, you know, George is self-taught. Unlike most of the New York kids who came into the field, he didn't even go to art and design. He went to one of the Catholic high schools that were in his area. Those schools did not have significant art programs. He may have had some art teacher along the way. He may have had some English teacher who was sympathetic to him, but there was no one there saying, you can create George. And he comes into the field as an artist. You know, I was aware of his work two minutes before Marv was because he was drawing for a friend's fanzine in Brooklyn. It was sort of the Catholic school gang doing a, doing a fanzine that over, overlapped some of the guys who were playing with the comic reader at my time. So I had seen his, his early fan work through that, which had enormous promise. But it really wasn't, I think, until the process of working with Marv on the Titans that he began to understand that he could be a, be a writer and that there wasn't some magic potion that we had taken early on in our career or some textbook that we had read that he had never been near that uh, authorized us to use a keyboard instead of a pencil. And what you saw in his Wonder Woman work, really his, his first important writing, his humanity come through purely, and much of that developed in the back and forth with Marv, but more important, the confidence developed because Marv brought him into that process so totally, they had so much fun together. It used to be delightful to just sit there and hear the stories about their plotting sessions. You know, unlike what we get ret retrospectively about Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, you know, at, at odds creatively and at odds personally through the process and still managing to do some brilliant work. This was two guys having a ball together out in the swamps of Queens. And it showed in all the work and it gave George the confidence to fly solo after that. And when he did, he was one of the best writers in the business. Wonder Woman is an extraordinarily difficult character to write well. Many of us have failed. I certainly did on her. Um, 
no besmirching anybody else who's present, no. who, who had a turn, but she's a tough broad. This is a tough, tough structure to pull off. And George not only did it well, he did it better in a modern sense than anyone had before. And in a pure human sense, it was some of the most human material that DC was publishing in any title in those years. It was extraordinary. And at the time, I remember thinking, and again, you guys are professionals, and I'm, you know, just a poor fan schlub. But it was my, one of my favorite runs. No, it was my favorite run of Wonder Woman. Uh, with, and again, as you say, Paul, without besmirching anybody else's run on anything, it, it, just, it seemed definitive. It was like, there's really, you know, there's nothing else you can say about Wonder Woman that he didn't say during his run. Maybe there's, there's a little bit, but, but. It was, it was just so human. Yeah. It was a moment in comics where you could deal with the humanity of characters in a way that we were not encouraged to by the structure of the market for the previous 25 years. And lots of people were rising to that challenge. And certainly what Marv and George were doing together on Titans had a lot of that going on. But most of us took little halting steps towards it. And George just dove in. And here's a, in George style, a large cast of characters with different personalities. Here's challenging stories. We're going to deal with issues that we don't customarily deal with in mainstream superhero comics in this era. Not that it was dark. It wasn't, in many ways, it was brighter than Wonder Woman had been previously, but you could feel his love of humanity. And that's, I think, one of the enduring things that George has brought to so much of his work. This is just a guy who both constantly remembers how lucky he is, which many of us forget along the way or forget for a minute or two. Uh, you spoke about Kubert before, Kurt, as a positive example, much like Joe. You know, Joe would sit there and explain how he was just the luckiest man he knew. And George didn't even have to say it. He beamed it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, we're, most of us around the table here are far grumpier bastards than George. <laughs> um, and just, you saw that positivity in the work and the, the down to earth humanity. Tell me, Piggy, tell, I'm piggybacking off what you're saying there, Paul. I have a question for, for Marv, if, if I may, which is that I, I think a real watershed moment in comics with Titans was not necessarily the first few issues, although, yes, but the day in the life issue, yeah. which you did. Issue eight. Which, yeah, exactly. Which, you know, we didn't do that kind of stuff back then. Nobody did that kind of stuff. It's, it's heroes not in costume being humans. And I mean, I guess my question is, do you rem have any memory of where that sprang from? Or it was kind of a kind of a courageous decision at the time, creatively. It's it's interesting because uh, as Paul was talking, I was thinking when, about the humanity. I was mm -hmm. thinking about that particular issue. Um, I had come in with the original idea uh, as I tended to the the rough concept of what the story is going to be about, and then we would meet. Uh, we lived six blocks from each other. Uh, we would meet at this diner and start hashing it out. Then I type up a plot or whatever. We got to uh, that particular issue and we're talking it over. And he comes up with the idea of Cyborg seeing this little kid and is afraid he's going to freak at the monster. And mm -hmm. the kid holds up his own hand. Mm -hmm. And I went, we're co-plotting this book from now on. Yeah. Uh, he, he gave it. He kept pushing the humanity as I did. But... He was able to do it in a subtle way. You know, I could do it in dialogue, but he, the visuals will have a greater impact. And it, that was 100% George. Um, and he just did it beautifully. Uh, I think he may have even written a little note as to what the dialogue could have been. And I think I followed it because he was correct. You know, mm -hmm. you don't change stuff for ego. You, change, you do it for 
this is the right what this is exactly what this panel should be this is exactly what the story should be and you don't change that and he did it and the thing that drove home to me i'm sorry the thing that drove home to me how much George brings to his story is when we did Future Imperfect, I had a sequence, it's set like 80 years in the future, and I had a sequence in there in which the Hulk walks into the uh, trophy room that's being maintained by Rick Jones. And uh, what I said in the plot was the these things have to be in the trophy room because I was thinking ahead to the next issue. We need Captain America's shield, the Silver Surfer's board, Wolverine's adamantium skeleton, and Thor's hammer. And everything else, you know, anything else you want to put in, feel free. And what he drew <laughs> was this thing, which has like a hundred different things in there. And it's insane. I mean, I actually wound up having a contest in one of my column in comic buyer's guide in which people were invited to write in and try and identify every single thing in here and it's insane i mean it's got archie andrews's riverdale sweater <laughs> it's got crow t robot from mystery science theater i mean it's just insane and that really made very clear to me how much george brings to the party I just I just wanted to say that one of the fascinating things about those first 10 issues or so of Wonder Woman that George uh, did was basically watching the training wheels come off. Mm -hmm. um, when that series started, it was to be written by Greg Potter and drawn by George. And very rapidly, it was co-plotted by them and scripted by Greg. And shortly thereafter, it was plotted by George and scripted by Lent. And shortly thereafter, it was, no, it's all going to be George now. And you could sort of see it at each stage. He was like, no, I can do this. I can do this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, he, didn't, he didn't walk into Wonder Woman going, I can write this. But he had so much passion for the character and interest and a determination to do right by the character that that you could just see him issue by issue going, I know how to do this here. And eventually it became, I should be doing it myself. And I'm sure Karen had a lot to do with encouraging that. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but watching that process was, it was very interesting to me as a writer at the time, reading it and going, Look at what go what look at what's going on here. He's just, you know, he's he's taking on more and more, and he's right every time. I think Kurt, in what Kurt's saying, is one of the things that I think is fascinating about George. In many ways, he's an egoless artist. He really, with whether it was as an artist or as a writer, but as a creative person. He always loved the performance. He loved the fact that he was reaching people. He loved the fact that people were enjoying it. And he loved putting as much as he possibly could, what Mark was talking about in terms of that Brave and Bold cover. You know, most of us who are proud of our work want to make sure we're delivering fair value, right? We want to. We want to entertain where we're supposed to. We put, our, we put ourselves into the work, but he, it, what, for him, it was, what is the most I can possibly do with this? And whether that was the extra 4,000 characters or the kind of detail Peter was talking about in terms of the trophy room, or can I please have the most difficult assignment in the place? I mean, when, when Dick Dillon, suddenly passed on just in the middle of doing Justice League after decades, you know, George would have killed anyone else who stood in his way of doing it because this was a chance to take on as big and complex an assignment as there, there was in the DC universe. Um, and sure, I can do Titans and Justice League and, 
I can probably do four, four, four other, four other things at the same time. Um, yeah. Um, anybody else would be running in terror. <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, I'm sorry, Greg. Go ahead. I, I was just thinking back to, you know, what was the first George Perez work I saw. Um, and I, I, I checked a, a, you know, a chronological list of what he's done. And it was like, oh, in the same two month period, I picked up an issue of Inhumans that he drew, Avengers, Fantastic Four, and Deadly Hands of Kung Fu. All, you know, he was drawing all four series simultaneously, and they all look good. So it, yes, he, he, he always wanted to take on as, as, as much of a challenge as he could, but please, Mark, go ahead. Well, all I was gonna say was that, you know, again, piggybacking off what Paul was saying about his, the performative nature of George and the, the enjoyment of, of, of delivering is his relationship with his fans and, and what a mark he leaves there. I mean, and that, that comes from me watching him just say, okay, my fans expect this. My fans expect this level of craft. My fans expect this level of detail and not in any way that made him feel like a short order cook, but just more like, okay, this is what I want to deliver because I like my fans. I respect my fans and I want to give them what they want. And again, I, you know, anyone who's ever seen him interact with fans, he just, he sets the bar uh, in terms of just making everyone feel heard. Every one of them feel loved. You know, I've never seen him have a bad day with a fan. It's the personality he has as a person. Yeah. You know, so many of the wonderful artists in this business are either shy, you know, you get Jose Luis Garcia around a room full of fans and he's almost embarrassed to, to be respected as much. Um, you, or they're full of their own ego and they're performing in front of the fans, but it's applaud me because I'm truly wonderful. And you have so, told me 300 times I'm, how wonderful I am. I, won't won't describe any of the worst idiots we have in that category, but you, you've all you've all seen them. But for George, George was that kid on the fanzine. Mm -hmm. It was you're you're reading my stuff, you're enjoying my stuff. Did, did you like it? Could I do better? You know, wait till you see the next thing I do. I'm going to find a way way to do better. He dealt with everyone as a peer. To the fan community, which is something a lot of us would have difficulty doing um, and certainly would not do nearly as well as he did. And he just, he delighted in it. He, yeah. When George would be sitting at the Heroes Initiative table at conventions, he would charge for sketches. But when he was at his own table, he didn't charge for sketches, which in this day and age... Basically is almost kind of unknown. I mean, because artists will charge 20, 30, 50 dollars. George would bang out a head sketch and give it to the fans. And people would try and give him money and he wouldn't take it. So I mean, you know, that that's an attitude that's almost extinct yeah. in uh, at modern conventions. But George right. would not charge. Yeah. I guarantee you that there are fans of George's large numbers of fans of George's who probably have never even read a George Perez comic. They're just fans of the guy mm -hmm. from all of the interactions they've had with him over the year, all the, all the things he's done for fans. To follow up on what Peter was saying about uh, the charging, he didn't keep that money. That went to the Hero Initiative. He was right, always right. raising money. Uh, he wasn't charging for himself. It was for the charity. Oh, and no, that's why I said it when he was at the Hero's Initiative table. You oh, know, yeah, but but yes, obviously, the money was going to the Hero Initiative. He, he also would uh, charge not for quick head sketches, but for uh, a little more detailed sketch uh, at his table. And he would do it, you know, he would, he would collect money from those sketches for the Hero Initiative. And when I'd be sitting there with him, he'd tell people, pay him to add a word balloon <laughs> and, and give it to the Hero Initiative. So, so just by sitting down next to George, to, to, to interact and talk to fans, um, he, he kind of turned me into a fundraiser for the Hero Initiative too, which was great. Um, and and uh, there have been several conventions that I have uh, 
uh, I, you know, I've, I've offered to do word balloons for contributions to, to the HERO initiative or the CBLDF or something like that. Um, and uh, that gets really wearying because it's hard to, to, uh, to, to come up with varied word balloons where you can clearly tell which character it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one encounter with George decades and decades ago when I was a horny teenager and George was sitting at a convention and you could just walk up to anybody. Remember back then when you could just have a conversation with somebody, you didn't have to stand on line for five hours. So George was sitting there, he was just doing sketches for fans and I was a horny 19 year old. And I said, uh, and he was drawing the Fantastic Four at the time. And I said, could you draw the invisible girl with invisible clothes? <laughs> and he was more than delighted, but he didn't just draw Sue. He drew her on like a terrace on the Baxter building with the <laughs> human torch in the background and Franklin sitting there looking at a magazine and Reed looking over. I mean, this thing was packed with details. And he's like, I am so happy you asked me to do that because nobody ever asks me to draw these, these characters naked. And I love drawing them before I have to put costumes on them. <laughs> George, George has, has occasionally told, well, more than occasionally told people how to spell his name by saying it's the PER from pervert and the rest is easy. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me, tell me some stories about George that would make him laugh. Uh, because he's still around. So I want him to enjoy this. So tell me a good story about George that would make him laugh. I was at a Dragon Con and he had a, a, a table at Artist Alley. And I told him, you know, and, and I showed up and we were chatting and I told him that I was in a um, community theater production of Lil Abner, that I was playing Mary and Sam. And George says, my God, I was in Lil Abner. I played Abner. And I said, that's great. And he says, them city folks and we uns are pretty much alike. And I immediately responded with, though they ain't used to live it in the sticks. And we launched into a full rendition <laughs> of the country's in the very best of hands. While the fans are standing there watching this, stupefied because the chances were 90% of them had never heard this song before, which is a really hilariously funny political song. And I recommend anyone go on YouTube and look it up and see Peter Palmer and Stubby K performing it. <laughs> and if this was in the day of cell phones, I can assure you that someone would have recorded it and it would be up on YouTube now for, you know, forever. But uh, that was just so freaking hilarious. I don't know if it would make George laugh, but you know, I can follow up on Mark's Legion story um, by mentioning that when George and I started on Avengers, um, I asked George, which, which Avengers would you like to use? And his immediate answer was, all of them. <laughs> um, and then when we did JLA Avengers, I asked him again, <laughs> which, which leaguers, which Avengers would you like to focus on? All of them. It's, it, it's just, you know, it was, it was his automatic answer. I mean, I managed to get, you know, the, the, the truth was he wanted to draw the Scarlet Witch, you know? He wanted to draw the Vision some. He really wanted to draw the Scarlet Witch. He wanted to draw the Beast so even though we couldn't use him regularly, we got him in for a couple of issues. Um, uh, but he, he wanted everything. Um, and, and as Mark said, the dead ones were a little tricky sometimes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but we got there anyway. One of the things that is so strong with George, and we've talked about it in terms of his um, storytelling, but his humanity with the fans and how he treated the fans uh, and also how he would treat other people at conventions. He, the convention would open at say 10 o'clock in the morning. He'd get there at nine and, and do autographs or sketches for the workers because they wouldn't have time to leave the table later. Hmm. Who does that? I mean, it's incredible. He, he, for an hour, he'd be drawing just for them. And then the doors would open and everyone else would come in and I'm sitting next to him and I'm just going, you know, every 10 minutes I'm, I'm off to the bathroom or something and he's sitting there all day long, never gets up. 
doesn't break for lunch, doesn't break for a snack, doesn't break to use the facilities, no, just sitting there because he wants to make sure all the all the people in line and they were all given numbers, uh, everyone would get a sketch. Again, who does that? You, you, yeah. you, have, you, you The only way something like that can happen is if you love, love, love what you're doing. And it just seems to me from listening to all of you that what George is about is he just loves what he's doing in whatever place he is or whatever creative thing that he is doing in the moment. Yeah. One thing I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, I'll talk about it a little bit, but we're all writers who work with George. So I'd like to hear how everyone else felt about this. Um, I will confess, George and I didn't cope a lot. A lot. Um, I mean, if I asked him something, he would say all of them. Um, but specifically, when 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 we did Avengers, um, he had asked uh, for me as one of the writers he'd like to work with on Avengers because he'd been he'd been offered the job writing and drawing the book, and he felt like he was you know 10, 15 years out of date on the Marvel universe, and he he didn't have the time to do the research it would take to know what was going on to do a book as you know, as, as, as big character focused as the Avengers. Um, so uh, I was figuring out a lot of the stories with the editor, Tom Brevoort, but I was giving George plots, but the way I do plots is I break them down into panels because that's how I can figure out how not to ask for too much. Um, so you know, every paragraph of my plot is in my mind a different panel and I'll make sure, you know, back then I was trying to do six panels a page or less, you know, on a, on a, on a page that's got a lot of action, you know, three, four panels, maybe five. Um, and I would send this stuff off to George and in my mind, because I was thinking, you know, classic comic storytelling, how much can you get on a page? What I was seeing in my mind was basically the Avengers as drawn by John Buscema. You mm -hmm. know, exciting, straightforward storytelling. And then the FedEx package would arrive. And holy cow, you know, it was the, the George Perez part. You know, I wasn't writing George Perez comics. George was doing all of that. You know, by the time we were done, it was George Barrow's comments because I'd give him a five, six panel page and he'd come back with 14. Yes. Um, he would and you'd he have would, to find dialogue for that, for those 14 panels. Very small <laughs> pieces of dialogue. I, yeah. I, I understand why Marv learned to, to, to write dialogue in like, you know, here's a clause, dash, dash, here's another clause because you can fit that much into that much space. Yeah. And, and if I would have a, uh, a moment where X happens and as a result of X happening, Y happens, well, they wouldn't be next to each other. X would be here, Y would be down here. There'd be seven panels in between. And it was sometimes a challenge, but always, always an enjoyable challenge to figure out dialogue so that you could still make it clear that Y was happening in response to X. Yeah. Um, but there was one moment that was just, well, there's more than one, but I opened a story with a scene, you know, there was some something happening on page one and then on page two, the Avengers walk into a, a, a security facility and they shake hands with some general and they talk about what's going on. Very, very straightforward. George drew that from the top of the atrium. Atrium? <laughs> now there's an atrium and there's like five mezzanines full of soldiers going all over the place with technology and so forth. And we see the Avengers from above walking across a catwalk so that they can shake hands with this general. And George had just figured out the most difficult way to draw this scene, but also the most exciting way to draw the scene. It's like, you know, at one point I gave him a page where I asked him to draw 
a bunch, you know, this was a historical flashback. Here are a bunch of Avengers villains. And I, I literally listed like 84 villains. And I said, George, this is just a list so that you don't have to do the research. You can pick whoever you want. There were, he, he didn't draw all 84 of them. He drew 83 of them and then another 12 because he put both Zodiacs in it. Even though the Avengers had never fought the other Zodiac, but the one character he left out was, I mentioned the Crimson Cowl and he thought, I know who that is. And he drew Red Ronin, um, <laughs> which, you know, he had, he had designed Red Ronin, I'm pretty sure, but that was the issue he, he, he drew from a hospital bed. And that's another thing about George. He was, he was absolutely determined. When he took on Avengers, he'd been through a few years where um, he had difficulty meeting deadlines. And there was talk around the office that, oh, George is drawing Avengers. Well, when's the first fill-in going to be needed? And George heard about that. And George was not only the last guy of the Heroes Return artists to need a fill-in. George went 15 issues, two of them double-sized <laughs> without needing, you know, and, and like I said, one of them drawn from a hospital bed because he was not going to be defeated. Yes, he was, he was, he was, he was going to not only beat everybody else who was battling the schedule, he was going to beat them by so much that his reputation from before that was completely erased. Completely erased. I mean, he had what I like to call a John Travolta career at that point, which is he, had, he everybody forgets, he was ice cold in, in like the mid to late 90s, just everyone was afraid of him because there were, you know, if there were deadline problems because of his health or whatever, but he just wasn't getting the calls and Avengers is what put him back on the map. And he, he got an encore and made a, you know, a second career out of it almost. Hmm. The, the, uh, he, he, in Titans, he was on the book for five years, a little bit more, more than five years. There was one fill in an issue four, but we knew about that before we started. We knew that that was going to happen, so it's not the same. Um, crisis, 12 issues, a couple of them double sized issues, always there, always on time, uh, always brilliant. Um, yeah, he. He didn't miss any of that stuff. Uh, if it was in the early days was a problem, he certainly, by the time we were on Titans, he didn't miss any of that stuff. And he contributed far more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, that's gotta be why he retired because his health was deteriorating to the point where he knew that he could no longer meet deadlines. And as far as he was concerned, if he couldn't meet the deadlines, he was no longer a viable person to hire as an artist so you know being able to meet his commitments was absolutely vital to him the uh the other story i'll tell about george's dedication is the cover to jla avengers 3 jesus christ <laughs> that's the cover that has everybody on it. and it took us weeks to figure out the complete roster for the justice league and the avengers to that point so that we could give him that list but most people have only seen that piece of artwork printed. He didn't draw that on normal artboard. He drew that on artboard that was so big, he couldn't get it on his drawing table. He had to pin it to the wall. And he drew that cover standing up and- and you know, Like Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, yeah. Yes, yes. and. The reason JLA Avengers 4 was about a month late was because he gave himself tendonitis doing that cover. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he drew, uh, he, he, you know, he, he had to rest for like three weeks. His doctor said, you won't regain the use of this hand if you don't rest. Um, uh, and, but once he was medically cleared to, to draw again, he drew JLA and Avengers 4 in a, in a hand split. That one oh piece God. of art, I, I don't even know 
how you construct something like that or how you can I, 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 how you build something like that as an artist i don't i can't even envision that much less what he pulled out of it but how do you even how do you even begin to build that just the choreography alone of those still images to make sure everybody's in there and it's readable as a coherent story as opposed to just throwing people at, at the wall he makes everything look like yes this could be possibly happening it's almost like it like a mo motion picture director was it isn't well, it's it? also there's also depth to that shot which is anybody can draw a, a billion characters if they're in the same plane and they're all right up front it, it he just built it with dimension as, as top and on top of everything else that was he, what was impressive to me. I, I think that he 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 blocked it out for this is this is the front level where all yeah. of the really major characters are and then the next level has secondary characters and then the next but at each time he said but leave space so that when you finally get to the and there's a green lantern bubble back there with seven people in it including that actress lady who who was given honorary avengers membership after her death you know she's going to be standing there and she's gonna be recognizable just very very small we had uh, we but, had um, go ahead mark no i was going to say we had the same thing with the crisis on infinite earths cover that alex ross uh painted most people don't realize george drew that right on gigantic artboard yeah, uh, so that Alex could do the painting on top of it, but George put those sixteen thousand characters in there. Uh, but first, since he knew he wasn't going to be doing the uh, the finish art, he checked with Alex, and Alex said, "All of them." Yes, all the yes. characters. <laughs> and so George just went crazy, and Alex and I, one of the few things on my wall here. Uh, just looking at the 15 million characters that he did, and all of them are perfect. They look exact. They're the primal image of those characters, the definitive image of those characters. For anyone who, for anyone who's watching this and is not familiar with the cover, <laughs> there yeah. it is. Yeah. Don't I mean, worry. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna insert it in. Don't worry. I'll be doing oh, okay. a bit of editing on this. But they. Alex, <laughs> Alex painted that pin to the wall too. Not not that one, but the yeah. crazy one. I forget. And, and Kurt will attest to the fact that Alex has the George Perez. I want to draw them all, but. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Alex does that for fun. He yeah. did this wonderful double paint. You know, double paint would be a wraparound cover. It was a cover of everybody he ever thought was inspired by the faucet Captain Marvel. Mm -hmm. and, and he did that knowing that legal stuff would make it impossible to publish that because he'd need permission from so many people who don't work well together that, <laughs> that uh, but he did it because he wanted to. But that's, you know, I forget Marv whether that crisis cover or that JLA Avengers cover came first, but whichever one came first, George actually had a number. You know, he knew how many characters he put on the one got cover, and he was determined to get more on the next one. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so, uh, so he, you know, he he was checking them off, counting them, and saying, "Okay, you know, how do I get more?" characters so I can have drawn the most characters beating out the guy with the record for having done a cover with the most characters who was him <laughs> yeah yeah he's determined to beat his to, to beat his own record what 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 was his style of drawing you know people tell stories about Kirby and he would just like start at the upper left and work his way down to the bottom and just work work through that way have you guys watched George drawing? Did you ever, were you ever privileged to see him draw the stuff that you had written? And, and what was that like to watch that? Well, that's a Marv question for sure. Uh, and the answer is, I never saw him draw uh, anything outside of fan sketches. Holy smokes. Uh, yeah, wow. never. Always would have loved to, because I've seen Kirby draw. I watched yeah, Kirby draw a lot of the art. George um, had his sweatshop in his basement. <laughs> like, terrified nine-year-old. <laughs> so so maybe he didn't draw all that stuff maybe it was just you know yeah he had a group of uh nobody but kids. george would be that crazy to put it all yeah. in there so yeah he drew oh it God. okay oh, now so i'm obsessed with it i'm obsessed george, with this question has any of us ever seen george actually draw anything 
Aside Larger the, sketches uh, at conventions. Right. That's not and not to not to say he's not. I'm just saying that it's amazing that all of us have worked with him and yet none of us have actually seen him draw a page. Yeah. I wonder what that's like. Oh my God. No, I, I don't love I think I don't think that's an unusual thing. I mean, no. you know, so so few of the artists that I worked with did pages in the office yeah. in the years. You know, once once in a long while I'd get treated to see somebody doing something. Watching, I watched Sergio write pencil and ink an entire page in 22 minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's ready to, all right, I'm just going to go slit my throat. <laughs> on, on, a good, on a good day, I can type a script for a page in 22 minutes, maybe. Um, but most of the, most of the guys and gals I've never, I've never seen at the board. It's, it's magic. They're, we're not allowed to watch. We're not allowed to watch. Right. Speaking, speaking of assistance and George did not have assistance. We joked about that, but George started out as an assistant to Rich Buckler. Yeah. Um, so, so he, he was well aware that you, you could get people to draw your backgrounds for you, or sometimes even more than that. That's the fun um, thing. What's that? That's the fun thing, drawing all those backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> that was what stopped me, killed my ambitions to become a comic book artist dead. I was drawing a story of, uh, you know, just, just for fun. And uh, I drew the first page. And then as I was drawing the next page, I went, I have to draw this background again. <laughs> and, and I can lay out a page. I can rough out, you know, this is what I'm, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm intending. I can, I can even, you know, I've even done it so that, you know, I was working with an artist who was tra having trouble with the storytelling and the editor asked if I could do, you know, stick figure layouts. And I did that for about a year until the artist said, yeah, okay, I got it from here. But backgrounds, man, <laughs> I, I, I'm a storyteller. I'm not an illustrator. George is both oh. and, and very, very strong. So. My wife is a huge Doctor Strange fan, and he did wow. this wonderful sketch wow. of Doc for her. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of her most prized yeah. possessions. Of course. He did a lot of what I would call landmark issues for both Marvel and for DC. Certainly, I mean, there, were, there are many that could come to mind. One that comes to mind is that he got to ink uh, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, certainly one of the, one of the, one of the landmarks. Do you guys want to talk about some of those landmarks? And also, and Marv, you could probably speak to this, some of George's own creations. He worked he worked and played well with other people's sandboxes, but he also created some characters that, that have done very well. And certainly the Thanos snap uh, owes a great deal to, uh, to George. I, I don't know how many creator owned books that George had collaborated with until Saxon Violence. Had he done much? Well, what I, we had just done, we had just finished Future Imperfect and George mm -hmm. said, I would love to work with you on something else. Mm -hmm. And I pitched to him the concept of sax and violence with Jennifer Jean Sachs and Ernie Violin Schultz and their war against, you know, pornography and other good things. And George's first reaction was, can she, can she be Latina? And I said, sure. And just that easily, Jennifer Jean Sachs became Juanita Jean Sachs. And that really wound up shaping her character immensely. Um, you know, she she became Latina. That's, you know, that's what George drew. And all of her dialogue derived from that mindset. Uh, so she would not be remotely as interesting a character, I think, as if she had just been the white girl that I originally envisioned. And in terms of landmark issues, I mean, Marv, you can speak to how much he loved who was Donna Troy. Yeah. yeah. That was another one that uh, came, came out of him uh, so much, uh, so much of it. Uh, and so it... Uh, it was a pretty incredible, I mean, we had decided we were going to do the origin of Donna um, and finally get it down. And he came up, uh, 
He didn't, he wanted to just talk over the idea and work from that, not even even bother to have, a, have me do a plot on that. And uh, we talked over it and it came back 100% better than what we, anything we had ever talked about because he, he added so much of the humanity uh, in that and it was, it was just a great issue and he, he is so responsible for it. Uh, two of my favorite issues are the ones that he did. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you can keep us in suspense. What's the other one? <laughs> Excuse me? What's the, what, you keep us in suspense. What's the other one? Oh, the, the uh, issue uh, eight, uh, Day of the Life. Uh, Day of the Life, okay. Because up until, uh, actually through, tw up with the exception of that issue, up until about issue 20, I would uh, hand in fairly tight plots. Mm -hmm. Then George moved into uh, my area, uh, as I said, a couple, six blocks away or so, and we started to plot together. And then afterwards, we would only verbally plot after the Donna's thing, because he didn't need a written plot. He just needed to know what it was about. And we, we'd go from there. The fun ones were doing some of the, uh, the Judas contract material because we're at the diner and we're plotting out the story in detail about how we're gonna kill this 16 year old girl <laughs> and realize far later that there's an entire crowd of people having lunch right next to us, not one of which called the cops. Right? <laughs> but uh, luckily that that, that, yeah. that, that was the thing that he would uh, comment on or I would comment on because it was so funny, funny to us later on. Um, yeah. And, and awesome. Paul, I'm trying to remember, did, have you, did you ever work with George in creative level? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, you did World's Finest, right? Yeah, we did some World's Finest. The That's right. Strange yeah. setup they had where um, Kevin McGuire and George were bouncing back and forth. And we did uh, some, J some JSA work when we were, we're pinch hitting for Jeff, but none of that was done in what I what I would describe as my heyday. That was all done as sort of rusty Paul coming coming back after twenty years of not writing. So uh, I don't know that I was bringing my best game to it. But the it world's was fun, fun, Paul. Trust me, it was fun. Thank you. The, the world's the world's finest. The stuff that I really enjoyed was the again that the humanity of gesture. You know, there, there are only a handful of artists in this business who are as good at a couple of characters sitting around a coffee table as they are blowing up worlds. John, John Ramita, I think, probably is the standard setter for that, Ramita Sr. Um, but when George drew those gals sitting around talking and reacting with each other, you could feel the personality of them in the body language so vividly was delightful to write over that. You know, that's, to me, that's one of the marks of the best artists when you're working Marvel style. That the expression of the face makes the lines that you're putting in so much more personal because you can just, you can see what they must be feeling and then it's just a matter of shaping the exact dialogue to fit that. And that's more responsive, at least for me, than writing it full script. Um, I don't, don't often get the pleasure of working with someone who can do that, but I've had it a, a few times in my career. His faces are, his faces are great. Um, lots of times you can't tell the characters unless they're wearing their costumes. But if you saw, especially in, in JLA Avengers, you know, Here's the Scarlet Witch, and she's next to the Wonder Woman, and you know their faces are just that's Wonder Woman's face and that's Scarlet Witch's face, and they, the characters all look different as opposed to you could just take one face and put it on another, as with some artists. And again, it's just the costumes, the faces, the expressions on the faces, the the, the interacting the of the characters. Well, George was one yeah. of the first to do to give the female characters different looks, different bodies. Yep. Uh, you know, for the most part, uh, women characters in comics were Betty and Veronica. They were the dark haired or long haired, uh, but otherwise they pretty much had the same body type and the same look. You can watch his, his growth on the Titans as the characters started out similar, uh, 
also with that Betty Veronica stuff, but very quickly, each one became a unique individual, a unique character, totally different body types, totally different looks to each one of the characters. And he really played off of that and gave people, made people individuals. And you didn't see a lot of that before. Before we go, quick message, uh, take away a message to George. Uh, some of you will be talking to him. I, I, I am imagining any messages that you want to send out to George on behalf of yourself, on behalf of fans. It's been an Thank honor you. working with you, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for all you've done for, for us individually, for us collectively, for the form, um, for DC in particular. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for thank you for all the times that you MC the Dragon Con Masquerade with me. <laughs> we became the kind of gold standard of what fans wanted because every freaking year that I would go to Dragon Con, people were always saying to me, "Are you and George going to be hosting the Masquerade this year?" And whenever they bring in somebody else who is not really well received, people just go, "Ah, eh, it's not George Perez and Peter David." So. <laughs> Gentlemen, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. I am honored. You are five of my absolute personal favorite writers. I always look forward to when, when, when you have a book out. The books you did with George are hold a place of honor on my, on my uh, shelves. And, uh, and, I, and, and I can't thank you enough for doing this. I did it because I'm a fan. I did it because I admire each of you. I did it because I'm a fan of George. And I just wanted to do something to express on behalf of all fans, probably, how heartbroken we are. And, and as you said, thank you to him. I say thank you to, to you guys. And thank, thank you to George. Uh, thank you for all the hours and hours and hours of entertainment um, that you've given us. Uh, for those of you who are watching this, uh, we've set up some information which we which we will have lower thirds to where you can contribute uh, in George's honor. He's still with us. I know that um, his wife Carol has been has been very good about keeping fans informed, and I'm sure he reads your 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 letters, your emails, your messages, whatever you're sending, and I know it must be keeping his spirits up. So. Thank you, gentlemen, again for everything. Happy to do it. Happy to.